Welcome to, uh, this is the next to last lecture from the SOA uh, lecture series for the fall. We have uh, one more lecturer this coming uh, Monday, Michael Bricker, uh, one of our alumnus, uh, alumni, which should be really kind of thrilling. Uh, I'm David Heyman, co-chair with uh, Clay Odom for the lectures and exhibitions committee. We're super thrilled to have Liam O'Brien here. We, those of you who've been listening in know that he is like the prodigal, our prodigal son in so many ways because we, we hired him. I swear to God, Liam, you were, I think when we hired you, you looked like you were just out of middle school. <laughs> Although he had in fact been teaching at uh, Berkeley in Ohio. I swear to God, you, when, I remember when you gave your public lecture, I was like, this guy is not, someone please get this birth certificate. I mean, he's so uh, young. I was, uh, 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 in fact, we had him just here for a couple of years and then he has been uh, at MIT uh, since 2009 as an associate professor there. And uh, among other things, uh, has uh, uh, a couple of things that are uh, worth noting. Uh, most of you know uh, that Liam, W-O-J-R, uh, the Woger uh, website is perhaps the kind of most charming <laughs> of the architectural websites on the entire uh, internet. And then he's also a co-founder of the collective LOK and a proud alumnus of Hobart College in, uh, in uh, New York City. So uh, aside from having the most charming website, there's a couple of other things about Liam that I'm uh, always thrilled about. On a private level, I'm really thrilled that he's one of the kind of few people who's still channeling John Haydick a little bit wisely and well, which I just, I love about uh, uh, Liam's work. And uh, uh, maybe if we have time at the end, we'll talk a little bit about that. Liam, as most of you know, he's on right now on like everyone's list of top 10 up and coming architects. I mean, just like every one of them and, and like the top 10 architects you wanna have for dinner if you wanna have dinner with an architect kind of list, you know. You know, Vanguard, I mean, you know, I mean, just you name it all there. He, it, and with, with, uh, with good reason, I mean, uh, uh, through a series of primarily speculative projects, he's won just award after award after award after Rome prize after award, PA award. I mean, kind of everywhere you look, there is this, this kind of uh, interesting front coming at us uh, that is uh, Liam, which, which I really love. And, and, and it's, it's, again, it's like, uh, it's particularly exciting given that we knew you when you were younger and then to see uh, you kind of breaking through is just mind bending. So I want to tell you briefly that uh, we met uh, Liam uh, when we did a search in 2007, 2006 for, a, for like literally a digital person. And it was a big debate, like what a digital person was and where digital was gonna go. And we, we had, it was a great search, by the way, we also got Cisco out of that search, although from a different part of it. So the thing about the candidates that came in, we had all these candidates come in and they all made the same argument. They all argued that this kind of, the, somehow the, the new forms of representation would inevitably lead to a certain kind of architecture following from the controls and following from the complex geometries that you could generate with, uh, with digital technologies, which for those of us who'd come out of modern was a kind of arguably specious argument. It was the same kind of rhetoric that had been used to justify aspects of the modern. It was really problematic. And then to top it all off, Mark Del Benedict would ask each of those candidates, I really love this question. He would say, isn't that same technology used to make that shitty hotel on the interstate? To which they had to say, well, yeah, it is the same technology and it is. But Liam was the only person that kind of came in with this, I think a thesis and the thesis had to do with the idea that digital representation, it's real consequence in architecture would be the destabilizing of what you understood to be real. And, and, and that was, and we were all, everyone, I remember everyone waking up in, in, the, in the audience going, that, yeah, you're right. That's actually an interesting kind of possibility. And then he, at that time, brought out a kind of young thesis, which has developed since then, that because as architects, we were going to increasingly be communicating with each other by these means, and those means are primarily photographic, that really as an architect, what you do is you generate photographs. And he kind of posed this kind of project that he was going to be generating a kind of portfolio of buildings that were largely non-existent, but were going to exist in this kind of new realm of, of the digital. And I, I just remember going, that this sounds like a fascinating project. And so, of course, and it was a fascinating project, so fascinating that, of course, after two years, MIT snapped him away uh, because uh, they, with the lure of their just outrageous visualization lab, which then Liam has used, of course, to his uh, uh, remarkable credit to generate a series of really astonishing projects. I mean, they, the weird thing about those projects, of course, is that they have, in theory, although I don't know if I believe this, Liam, they've led to real projects, 
that are out there. Like, so it, it's either they've led to real projects like the House of Horns that many of you know who follow Liam on Instagram, which separately, Sandy is 100% convinced is the house for uh, Brad Pitt, which it may or may not be, and you may not or may not be able to tell us if it is, you can blink like three times. If it's not, you shouldn't blink. That's all I'm gonna just don't blink. And then we'll, we'll move forward from that. And it could be that this work is real, or it could be that these are some of the most elaborately fabricated uh, images of construction sites on the planet. But we're so completely uh, honored to have you here, so completely excited. Liam, thank you so much uh, for being here. Let's dive in. Uh, we're gonna all kind of welcome you, Liam O'Brien folks. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much, David. Uh, that's, um, uh, I, I remember, yeah, you used to have this way of um, making uh, students laugh um, even while you were giving them really, really harsh feedback. Um, uh, I just remembered you had this beautiful way of delivering such feedback and, and making them smile. Uh, so I appreciate the laughs uh, before, the, before the talk. Um, well, thank you folks so much for, for having me back. Um, I uh, have such good memories of, of my, my time at UT. I have so many um, familiar faces and I'm so happy to be back here. Um, one, one thing I just wanted to mention before diving in is um, um, I've been on uh, leave uh, from MIT uh, for the last couple of years, year and a half or so, um, and I've been um, working, uh, I direct uh, the design team at, a, at a, a place called Samara, which is an offshoot of Airbnb. Um, and I, I mentioned that not to get into the work that uh, I'm doing there, but more to just say like, I've, I've been um, largely away from the academically oriented conversation about architecture for the last 18 months or so. And um, been, you know, talking with other audiences about architecture uh, a lot, uh, very frequently. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering if this has had some effect on the way that I talk about the work. Um, and I also bring that up because uh, one other memory about David is uh, he and I had the opportunity to co-teach a, a theory course together. And I remember uh, one of his um, you know, warnings to the students early on was, um, to, to never take an architect's explanation at face value. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering if I'm going to be able to, um, you know, uh, uh, represent the work earnestly and authentically, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna, gonna do my, my, my best. Um, <clears throat> I decided to put together a presentation today that is going to look at eight things that uh, Witcher has made or is making. Okay, uh, I'm assuming all looks good. Uh, if not, someone will, uh, uh, will let me know. Um, so yeah, I've, I've decided to, to, to show eight things. Um, and uh, some of them are uh, Um, some of them are some of them are unusual houses, and some of them are, uh, I would say, objects or like sculptural um, models that uh, try to take some of the thinking around um, the the residential scaled work and draw out new potentials uh, of those projects, um, potentially for other projects, or maybe more broadly, just to help us rehearse form um, and help us. Um, yeah, develop a, a, a more broad uh, formal language uh, for, for the office and for future work. Um, so I thought I would uh, start with, with this project. Um, this is an older project and I'm, I'm gonna kind of bounce back and forth between um, projects that are old, um, that are speculative and um, maybe documented quite thoroughly uh, to projects that are really new um, and that are not documented well at all <laughs> and um, just are exciting for, for me and I wanted to get your feedback on it um, to uh, other projects that are being you know, realized now uh, and, and maybe I'll uh, spend a little bit more time on the project that David mentioned, uh, the House of Horns project. 
Um, <clears throat> but this is a, a, a speculative, uh, ended up being a speculative project, although it was a commissioned project um, for a filmmaker whose uh, younger brother uh, uh, sadly passed away in the lake that the house um, was to overlook. Um, this is on the kind of cliff edge of Cayuga Lake up in Ithaca. And um, we had begun the project before this, uh, this event transpired and uh, very, really quickly we realized that um, the, the house that we were developing for this uh, site had to be markedly different um, now that this, had, this event had transpired. So uh, kind of in a sort of major pivot, uh, we tried to imagine a, um, another world that uh, the inhabitant could tap into that would be connected in some way, both symbolically uh, but maybe actually like um, uh, experientially to, to, to the lake. And so um, the, the mask became a device to separate the real world from the other, from um, another world. Um, the mask does a lot of things. Uh, it acts like a kind of threshold um, condition. And uh, it also does whatever it can to kind of blend in um, and become camouflage for the box that is behind. Uh, this is the site. Uh, it's a quite um, stunning site uh, where the, the cliff allows for the house to be, you know, perched up and get a pretty uh, majestic view of, of the lake. Uh, and we, we had uh, thought that there would be two different types of, of access, uh, one which would be more formal um, and would be more private, which is the one that you see on access with the, the mask. And then one that would be for uh, the, the friends uh, of, of the boy who died um, and that perhaps they could have uh, a more circuitous route and have an opportunity to be atop the, uh, the building and um, you know, have a way of viewing the site that you know, was separate from the more private um, and maybe more uh, intimate space uh, on the inside. Of, of the building. And so you see this sort of ramping circuitous through the trees um, kind of walk that brings you up behind the mask and up to the top of the, of the building. Um, the, the more formal access is, is like this and uh, you, one approaches the mask and then is kind of within a, uh, a slot of space um, that acts like a kind of gasket and that gasket kind of prevents any kind of immediate like horizontal or uh, yeah, kind of pre prevents uh, the horizontal view um, and recenters you uh, along uh, a new axis, which is an axis that is, is informed by the interior space. So you can kind of see how that plays out um, <clears throat> where you have this sort of straight shot that allows the landscape to kind of peel away from, from the building. And then you see that kind of slot of space that I think uh, attempts to reorient uh, um, the inhabitant and then that kind of very uh, direct uh, manifestation of an oriented space, which is that kind of C shape in section. And this is a visualization of that, that slot space that um, also shows where the, um, the stair uh, would go up and, and access the, the top. Um, once one is inside, uh, the, the hope is that all of the um, sort of secondary spaces the, the kitchen, the bathroom, and the like, um, sleeping nook, and all the storage is kind of pushed away um, and is like buried in thickness on um, uh, like beyond, or I, would, I should say like within the frame that is defining this, this view. So just to give you a, a, a sense for um, how that's achieved, um, it's through like a series of niches, one for the bed and one for the kitchen. Um, and then um, uh, also the, the bathroom and the storage is tucked uh, behind um, the, the, the very kind of, um, let's say like uh, evacuated is the word I'm looking for, an evacuated space. Um, so maybe that gets populated with a chair, maybe, maybe not. Um, but the hope is that that space feels as though it's a kind of um, space for um, contemplation and potentially mourning. Uh, but the, the hope was to kind of evacuate that space and keep it as sort of abstract uh, spatially and kind of um, warm materially as possible. This is a kind of x-ray diagram that, that, that shows the kind of hier hierarchy of, of spaces in the way that we were thinking about them. 
Um, <clears throat> now, uh, this is the a, a view from from above, and uh, you know, you'll you'll see in other projects that were really fascinated by um, by figuration, and so maybe this is the first uh, of of with many instantiations of our interest in, in figures. Um, you see the, the kind of uh, sparring of the, the figure of the um, skylight over the bed area um, with this rail figure. Um, and so I think this is a theme in our work that will come up again and again, especially in um, uh, some of the other projects that I'll show. Uh, a visualization that, that gives you a sense for how one would get pulled back behind the mask and how that would be a markedly different experience than if one were to kind of pass through the mask. Um, and the hope was that that would be reserved for, uh, you know, the, the, the main inhabitant, the, the brother of the, um, the boy who, who died in the lake. Um, and then there's this other idea about um, how to take uh, advantage of, of the site by offering up like the, the greatest number of, of different types of experiences of, of that environment. So um, they were already kind of um, available to us uh, in, in terms of the way that each of the, the windows um, kind of uh, developed relative to each of the spaces, but we tuned them in order so that they were uh, like each different ways of, of viewing the environment from the kind of like entirety of the space, the pulling in um, the, the, the context as in the case of the main space to a vertical, to a horizontal, to, uh, um, to like a, an upward orientation framing of the sky. And then that smallest one, which is at the scale of the body, at the scale of the head, where there's a kind of connection um, from the, the bed to uh, where the, the boy uh, perished. So uh, doing everything we can to kind of keep the the space is abstract and allow for the um, what we thought was the richness of the environment to really define the space. So we go from a vertically uh, oriented slot to a horizontal kind of band um, in the kitchen area, and then this bedroom niche that is like clearly other than the the shell of the main space. And maybe we'll get into this a little bit later, or maybe there'll be questions about it later, but. We do think a lot about the, the, the props and the wares um, in our visualizations as a way to draw out um, narratives and um, in some cases, like likely rituals that the inhabitants um, might make and um, use, use those as a way to really test whether the, the relationship between the work of architecture and the way that it might be inhabited or the lives lived within is creating the right dialogue. Um, and then this uh, led to us thinking about um, kind of extracting a couple of principles about the mask um, and expanding on them through these sculptural objects. So um, this is called Other Masks, and um, it's kind of taking uh, maybe three characteristics of the, the mask that we ended up designing for Mask House and imagining different instantiations of them. So. You know, one idea is like, well, it's really unusual to have the top part of, uh, of a house be the same as the bottom part of the house. What are other uh, techniques that we might explore that, that do that as well? Uh, another thought was like, how do we think about um, this uh, orientation and reorientation in the way that you move through that uh, mask? Um, and then another was, you know, what kinds of um, opportunities are there in the way that we think about like a, a thick 2D or like um, um, a slimmed up 3D, like uh, what, what kind of like additional richness might we be able to um, uh, explore when we think about things uh, in uh, having a kind of local three-dimensionality rather than a global one. And so just to, this is the model of the, the house proper. Um, and if you can't tell each of those um, uh, uh, wood planks represented in metal here um, is at a, a different orientation um, 90 degrees relative to one another 45 degrees relative to the um, to the approach and so is that that's what I mean by a kind of local um, uh, three-dimensionality and so you'll see that coming out here too uh, this is like a, what we call brush mask where um, you know there are ideas about uh, let's say 
porosity and openness, depending on where one is relative to the mask. Um, and then also I should say like using this as a chance to think about materiality. So, you know, uh, David's so right that, you know, a lot of the early stuff uh, relies on photorealism. Um, but we're also looking for ways of, of, of really getting familiar with materiality. Um, so these, you know, earlier sculptural object tests kind of help us get into that um, in advance of getting into it in the context of like a, a construction site. Um, just a couple more to go into a little bit more depth here. Um, this one here, you know, is like looking at the kind of maybe counterintuitive orientation of wood grain um, and then, you know, uh, developing an articulation of like folds um, that are, you, you know, uh, contrasting to the wood grain um, um, and then trying to be, you know, quite extreme about what those, uh, what those channels might yield. They're kind of trying to find a, a, a a strange scale at which those folds occur, uh, not at a micro scale, not at a macro scale, but this sort of uncomfortable middle ground. And then this one that we kind of, uh, we, we called uh, uh, Black Sun, um, you know, you could see us thinking about uh, types of uh, using projection as a way of, um, um, yeah, trying to like imbue this with uh, multiple, uh, like, I would say like trying to imbue it with multiple in, like modes of orientation right so like prompts one to move move about and 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 lock in uh with these different uh, uh like front uh, i would say like different fronts um and then this this last one that i'll go into in a little bit more depth just because it's it's similar to um the next project it'll give us a lead into the next project um this one is a lot like uh some of our totems that we made and, and i won't show those today but um it's a kind of hybrid of some of the uh, interests that we had for, for Mask House and some of the interests that we had in totems that had to do with like a, um, the ability to hold in suspension two different profiles, one being a kind of uh, sort of dumb, and I mean in the best way, like a, a kind of dumb profile, and then a profile which is you know more um, expressive, and then using one opening as a way to like give indication as to how one should understand those dual silhouettes. Um, and this gives us, a, I think, a, a pretty good segue into uh, the project that um, David was mentioning, which is the House of Horns. And um, for that project, we are like very much interested in those same issues um, and themes. Um, when it comes to like the projects within the project. And what I mean by that is there are um, uh, a, a couple of opportunities where we're, we're looking at uh, objects uh, that will be in the round and um, you know that prompt one to move about. This one happens to be a, a fireplace. Um, I'm gonna get back into this in a little bit, but I, I wanted to just explain the, the, how the House of Horns project developed. Um, House of Horns uh, is a little bit of an unusual one in the sense that um, it uh, was a half-built Spanish-style McMansion um, when we arrived. And this was the, the foundation that we in inherited. And, um, you know, we at the time found it like kind of idiosyncratic, but like super interesting as a way to, as a challenge to try to imbue um, a, a new kind of ordering system uh, within it. And um, we, we essentially uh, like also inherited the program. Um, so, you know, the number of bedrooms and the um, specifications about living areas and dining areas and kitchen um, are kind of all remain the same. Um, so there's not a lot of like Woodger design uh, thinking around how like the program exists, but there was a lot of thinking around how to distribute that program in a way uh, so that um, there was, yeah, like a lot more um, imbued order to, to the plan. And so pretty quickly, there was an understanding that, um, you know, maybe we could use this figure, kind of this um, uh, more public figure. That's the one that you see in, in white there. Um, and have that become a kind of instrument, a kind of instrument that would let light in, in unexpected ways. Um, and so when, when we say House of Horns, you know, I think it does look as though it's like horns, like an animal, um, but actually we mean horns in a different way. We, we, we mean it in terms of um, 
like how uh, an instrument uh, works. Um, and so there are six horns, each of which let in light in, in a different way. And, and it, they do so based on the location of the Clara story window, uh, whether it's a skylight or a Clara story. Um, and the hope is that like it becomes a device that activates that public space um, in, in really dramatic and, and, and hopefully unexpected ways. Um, there's another idea here, which is about trying to, uh, it's, a, it's a large uh, project, but trying to minimize and keep it as diminutive as possible. And so you see a lot of effort going into um, like depicting it as a, a one story project. There are uh, other spaces below um, and those kind of get treated differently. Um, they have light wells that bring in light. And so the landscape goes up and allows it to be read. Uh, we hope first and foremost, as a kind of um, uh, a one, one story uh, project. Uh, this is the reflected ceiling plan. And just to give you a sense for um, the way that those horns are, are working geometrically, they are, um, there's a lot of self similarity between them. Um, they are, uh, the, they're ellipses. And um, there's a lot of thought that has gone into like uh, how to think about drainage in such a case. And so we've been able to develop some uh, really um, idiosyncratic details that you won't see today, but um, are, are in the mix now as to um, how water uh, gets out, uh, gets off of the roof. Um, we, we built a couple of models before, um, you know, engaging with our structural engineer really as a way to, um, you know, well, first and foremost, understand the lines of continuity between these different horns um, and, and also to, you know, like, understand the hierarchy of structural elements that uh, we would have to wrap our heads around. So this one here obviously only has um, the large beams um, and you'll, so, you'll see a couple of photos of those later, um, but there's a kind of secondary, obviously like a secondary set of, of uh, structural elements that uh, populate where the wood, um, wood uh, veneer is now. Um, so here's what I mean about trying to keep it to a, a one story building. Um, and only at times allowing for the light wells to uh, indicate a, a lower level uh, below. You know, maybe it goes without saying, but we're super interested in the, the kind of um, the sectional possibilities of this uh, kind of boat hull, where there's a, a compression that gives just enough subdivision, uh, we think, to the two spaces to make them two, to, to like imbue it with a kind of two-ness, but also um, you know, allow for the spaces to be wildly continuous as well. So you can see the one on the left, obviously there's a, a skylight there and then a Clara story on the right. So yeah, the hope is that the way that the, the sunlight interacts with those two different, um, you know, window conditions will be, will be dramatic. And then, you know, a, a set of diagrams to kind of give one a sense for the, the formal vocabulary uh, and the consistency. Uh, across uh, each of these horns. So um, there's a, a series of visualizations that we did a, a few years ago here, and um, maybe to connect dots to something I said earlier, you know, like we're really interested in um, seeing if we can take advantage of what is unique about each project as a way to think about rituals and, and modes of living differently. So um, as we go inside, you'll see us like trying to reconcile what it means to like inhabit such a space and like is it interesting to start to think about it uh, less as a kind of formal dining space and a formal living space but can we think about it more as a kind of um, uh, uh, like for lack of a, of a better way of describing it like a field um, where there might be like areas of concentration that allow for different programs to happen um, and so although like what you see here may or may not play out exactly. It's our attempt to kind of like add a layer of um, thinking about narrative and, um, you know, challenge ourselves in terms of how living might occur differently in each of the, each, each of the projects. I guess one other thing to say about these visualizations is they, they have become um, helpful, not only in terms of um, all the things I mentioned before, but also 
in terms of um, like the the level of, of detail that that goes into them. Um, although you can never replicate being on a construction site, making a thing, realizing that the drawing that was made isn't the exact right fit for the contractor that you're dealing with. You can never replicate that. But um, by going through the process of like drawing and modeling every detail relative to one another in space, uh, for instance, you know, like um, how the track of the lift and slide works and how that butts up against um, the, the, the fantastical marble piece and the seams. Like when, when thinking about that kind of um, level of detail, I think it really um, has the possibility of like giving you, giving one some, um, uh, like foresight into what the challenges will be uh, when 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 the thing becomes a reality, and we've also found that it's useful in communicating with contractors. Like, yeah, we've actually thought about this before, and uh, we think that there's a solution that looks like this, and it has become a kind of like helpful um, aspirational uh, vision for for contractors as well. Um, <clears throat> so here is uh, us kind of thinking about the the different material materialities. Uh, in, in, in play from the terrazzo to the fantastical marble to the white oak to um, the, uh, the glazing. And then I did want to do just like a little detour here uh, and just talk uh, for a sec about um, the fantastical marble. And um, it, it, it's, a, it's a pretty um, uh, like humbling experience to go to a quarry. Um, you can see the scale figure in the lower left hand corner. Um, we uh, had an opportunity to go with um, our stone fabricator, Cora, um, the, the, the client, um, as well as um, the contractor to Danby Quarry. And um, we looked at all kinds of uh, marble together. And, and the one that uh, seemed to really stand out in terms of its like level of contrast and the level of um, kind of intrigue in the, the marbling is this little strip called Fantastical Marble. Um, and we uh, were able to try to, you know, select the, the best ones, which is a pretty amazing experience, frankly, like to see um, cranes come in and move them about um, and, you know, really try to understand what might be inside of each of these is a pretty compelling um, experience. Um, one of the uh, objects that we made for the House of Horns, um, which you'll see a, a little video of in a second, um, is this egg. And this egg is an object that separates a pool area from another area uh, in the house. And um, we're like really interested in, um, uh, let's say, ways of thinking about form that are um, like difficult to track in terms of their lineage. I mean, uh, and I say that with like a huge asterisk because I know everything, everything is not new. <laughs> but I think one of the things we try to do is like experiment with form and formal languages that we think are uncanny or that we hope are um, unusual. And so um, between the way that we made the fireplace and the way that we made uh, this egg, yeah, the hope is that like we're, we're, we're generating a formal language that is unique to each of the projects. Um, and when I say unique, I don't mean in the world, I mean unique for us. Uh, we're always interested in challenging our comfort zone in terms of, you know, what sorts of formal languages um, you know, we can uh, rehearse. So um, it had to be uh, put in before this lab was, was cast uh, above. It was kind of a ship in a bottle type thing. And you see the egg going into place here. And um, you know, this up close gives you a little sense for the, 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 the grain of the marble. Um, and this is where it's situated uh, relative to, to the section. And it kind of stands as this uh, column uh, between the the pool and the other area of, of this kind of grotto like space beneath. Um, this is a, a video. I'm, I'm sure it's super grainy uh, because of Zoom, and I apologize for that. But um, one of the things that we have been getting really interested in is um, questions of representation now that we're building things. And, you know, if the visualizations that we've been making are, um, let's say, more um, about the ordering principles, right? Like we are often using elevations as a way to keep things in line and tidy um, and really thinking about all the different uh, systems in a quantitative uh, as well as qualitative way, but like definitely having the camera views be um, not 
likely the views that you that one would experience moving about. Um, and so those are highly composed and it's really about uh, thinking about all the different ordering systems at work. What I'm pretty interested in now is like, what does it mean to be more opportunistic um, and be more um, like observant when it comes to the built work? Like, um, you know, just being on site and spending time there, it's like remarkably humbling to find things that, you know, you didn't consider and find um, like mistakes that are really compelling or, um, you know, find things that are beautiful that you didn't account for. And so like this that I just played here, you might not have been able to detect it, but um, there's a, a, a skylight and then above that is a tree. And then uh, we've been working with um, Caleb Heller, a cinematographer to think about um, motion and the way that motion uh, can be harnessed as a way to draw out, uh, let's say um, another level of experience of, of architecture. And so uh, in that clip there, uh, there was a very subtle movement of the, the way that the, the branches were um, affected by the wind, which was casting a shadow. And, you know, just thinking about the kind of fortuitousness of like the grain of the marble being not that unrelated to the grain produced by that shadow. And so, um, I guess you know, this is kind of early for us, but we're getting super excited about like drawing a contrast between the visualizations that we have made to make a project and then the types of documentation that we will make to, um, uh, you know, uh, show the project afterward or to um, show ourselves or learn ourselves uh, from the project. And so um, uh, a number of these were um, uh, taken by the cinematographer and they are stills from motion. And so, yeah, we're super interested to see like what sorts of um, possibilities come from um, making stills through motion. Um, you know, some of them are about the construction process themselves and just the kind of unexpected idiosyncratic beauty of like a, a moment like this where conduits coming out. Um, and then also like kind of ensuring that like the things that we hoped for are, are working okay, like the way that this uh, sunlight is coming into this light well. Um, and uh, so it is under construction and, and David, I can assure you that these, um, we're not spending our time visualizing uh, a, a construction site, although the thought has crossed our mind, um, but the, the construction is, is underway. And um, <clears throat> what's, Kind of cool about uh, these beams is we uh, we linked up with a structural engineer who is um, who who has worked on quite a few roller coasters actually, um, and so you know at, at first we were you know unsure about how that would translate in, into architecture, but um, their kind of ability and willingness to um, like take these geometries seriously and 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 make sure to ensure that they um, you know get uh, 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 articulated in the way that, that they were imagined um, has been uh, really inspiring. So um, what you see here is, uh, this is just black paint, um, but I, I kind of like this one um, because it, it shows the light well, one of the light wells uh, that will be almost entirely covered, you know, with, with earth soon. Um, and there's a dialogue between the figure of that light well, which is a circle and the, the graphic, which is highlighted with the, the white, which will soon go away once we have the uh, Shosugi Ban and the, um, the window frame and the, the black um, standing seam roof. Um, <clears throat> and then another photograph that is uh, from motion um, uh, depicting it in uh, under construction and um, in the morning. Now, um, you know, moving from one project about horns to another project about something that is vaguely, uh, uh, you know, crown-like. Uh, this is something that we're doing in the office right now. Uh, this is a project called Weather Room, and I won't spend a lot of time on it, but, um, you know, since uh, David mentioned uh, Haydick, I feel like um, I've got to, you know, link that um, uh, statement to this project. Like, we're really kind of compelled uh, by um, unusual figures that can like sort of uh, toe the line between sort of rational and in this case anthropomorphic or zoomorphic figures. Um, 
this this project has a is a a project that came about um, uh, with a discussion uh, in a discussion with with my son. He's a six year old, and he had um, suggested that like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if there was like an observation tower and a weather room up in the air where we could go and we could um, you know get closer to to the storms, get closer to winds. And so that prompted a way of thinking about um, an observation tower that is, um, you know, not shying away from the kind of anthropomorphic and zoomorphic readings. Um, and so, you know, there are these two shear walls that um, get leaned against one another and there's a circulation route that takes one up. The, what you're seeing here is a kind of study model for, um, uh, so there are a lot of placeholders kind of codes for actual stairs in an actual uh, nest uh, that will, you know, have um, uh, the proper, you know, boundaries, etc. Um, and then what you don't see going off of the screen is um, a, a, a balloon, a kind of weather balloon that would um, allow one to go up it and experience the, um, the weather, uh, you know, 100 feet above. Um, <clears throat> so these are some early uh, visualizations of a study model um, that um, I think this, this, this view does a good job of explaining like how those figures come to be. Um, there uh, really are a couple of layers at play here. One is a kind of a really straightforward structural diagram of the shear walls plus within those shear walls um, some you know uh, uh, rebar cages. And then um, uh, you know you can tell that the outline of the figures are designed to absorb the uh, circulation behind. Um, and then also like really reveling in the kind of caricature or like the characterness of this uh, uh, object. I'm just thinking about uh, if this were to be in a field far away, you know, what would it mean to like see this as a silhouette? So we're getting into a little bit of the totem territory where we're concerned with different silhouettes and how um, like the, the kind of um, zoomorphic characteristics can emerge or dissipate depending on where one is relative to the object. Um, and um, <clears throat> so what you see here are like what we are calling, you know, maybe for obvious reasons, like the, the, the two eyes or the mouth and the eye and the chin uh, on the, in the case of the other, um, other silhouette. And then there's a, a lot of thinking around, you know, what kind of um, like this, maybe this could be thought of as an instrument as well, um, like throughout the course of the day, is it a kind of sundial? And, you know, you start to understand um, through like, a very slow form of observation, you know, how the, um, how, how the object is depicted in its silhouettes on the ground over time. Um, and, you know, we're always looking for uh, excuses to make uh, drawings that teach us something else about the project. So this is um, our uh, attempt to draw through how like rebar might tell a different story about the project. So it produces this kind of fuzzy, um, you know, semi-ambiguous in terms of its boundaries type of, of drawing. And then and this is a little bit abrupt, I realize, but um, I, I just feel like it's important to, 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 to show every once in a while like a, an under the hood um, uh, uh, like process oriented image. And I would just say like, um, there's like very little um, that we won't do to depict an idea. And so this is you know, from, um, a morning where I, I'm, I'm making Nolan some toast and also trying to communicate with the team. And so is there a way to like uh, explain the project, um, you know, through two pieces of leaning toast and then an annotation over that. So I, I realize that that's kind of abrupt relative to the other um, kind of tonalities of images, but um, just wanted to, to show a little bit of our, our process as well. So um, in the more abstract version, you know, clearly these objects take on a kind of like Easter Island uh, type of, um, of quality. And the hope is that they are um, like really direct in the way that they might uh, conjure images of, of, of characters uh, in the horizon. Um, and given our interest in, in the attempt to make figures um, that are that kind of resist categorization, I'll shift over now to um, a new project that we're um, working on in the office um, for a kind of mixed use building that will be uh, likely be mostly concrete um, down in, in the Bahamas. It's a, um, 
it's a project that is a really interesting program. Um, it is a, um, it's uh, a, a really a place for gathering uh, around a, a hearth. There is a, a place for um, the making of creative work in the context of a studio. Um, and there is a, um, a, a couple of uh, like secondary bedrooms and then there's an observation tower and um, there is a, a small sauna and a plunge pool. So it's like a really interesting mixed use project. And um, it's, it's kind of smuggled into uh, like a, a jungle-like condition um, on an island in the Bahamas. And what you see here is our attempt to um, develop a, a, a semi-organic yet geometrically rigorous uh, method of, of figure making. And so if this, uh, if this looks strangely familiar, then you're probably a fan of Ellsworth Kelly. Um, we spent some time analyzing his figure paintings and because they, they kind of struck this amazing balance in our mind um, at, on the one hand, being almost sketch-like and completely organic and natural. On the other hand, they seemed, uh, and we had a trouble, sort of a hard time like pinning down how, uh, but they felt like rigorous and they felt disciplined. And so we wanted to look closely at that. And so what you see here um, is uh, our attempt to analyze um, a, a number of his paintings and each of the colors uh, uh, stands for a different um, radius. And so you could also think of this as a kind of abstract uh, geometric description of the concrete formwork, right? Uh, where each of the colors represents the, the type of curvature that would um, be needed to comprise this uh, organic figure. And so we're, we're rehearsing this because um, the way that we're thinking about the project is that there are going to be some elements, a plate, and then some elements up atop. And so the, the boundary of that figure can be amorphous. And so can we equip ourselves with the tool tools to um, you know, be certain about that formal language? And so a third one is here. Um, and for us, it felt like a little bit of a breakthrough in the sense that like, uh, if we had anxiety about making uh, organic figures, this could be a way that we could, um, we could use elements around the figure, uh, elements above and below it as a way to help tune it. But ultimately, like we had a way of describing it geometrically that was tied into a way that we would make it um, um, you know, materially. So here are, are just a few of the early study models where um, we're thinking about the studio space, the hearth and the stair as those objects on the bottom, and then really abstractly representing um, what we were thinking about kind of as like a still life uh, happening above. So the project has kind of moved um, in, in a direction that like makes the lower level more grotto-like and the upper level even more um, still life-like. But um, the, the idea of like a plate dividing a one world from another world is really compelling to us. And what you don't see here um, is that there are, um, the vegetation is incredible. And the vegetation like can tightly wrap the plate. And so the lower level can be effectively like defined by um, vegetation and the upper level will be uh, open to the sky. Um, <clears throat> I have a few more projects to show. I'm realizing that um, I'm kind of being a little bit slow here. So maybe I'll, um, I'll uh, well, I'll see. I, I might land on this one. Although I did want to try to get to one more at the end. So I might skip one, we'll see. Um, so uh, this is a project that is also thinking about uh, a series of different elements that have a, a way of orienting relative to another thing. So if the plate was that before with the objects below and the objects beneath, and in this case, um, a, a very attenuated hall um, provides um, a way of adhering these different chambers uh, along it. So when we use the term hall, in this particular case, we don't necessarily mean that it's a corridor, although it's that, but it also is um, the most social space of the house. Um, it's, it's a hall in that sense too. So um, we were really interested in this project uh, to look at, you know, um, homes like colonial homes that have a dedicated corridor off of which there are uh, different chambers that have like a very um, uh, deliberate 
and, and, and singular function, right? So if you've been in, uh, if, you know, if you're not from New England or if you haven't been in uh, a, a colonial home, some of them have, you know, these really compelling dedicated corridor spaces um, and off of which you, you know, go to, to access the, um, the particular programmatic elements uh, or the particular settings for particular programs. Um, so we're, we're, we're playing with that uh, typology here. Um, the, uh, the, I guess the, the, the primary difference is that the size of the threshold between the rooms and the hall um, are not the same as a colonial home, right? Like a colonial home might have a standard door opening between the hallway and the, the room. Here, we're interested in having, in most cases, um, the entire chamber up against the hall. So. Um, I'll explain in some other drawings, but um, you'll see uh, like the one the chamber with the apple on it, that's a dining cha chamber. <clears throat> it only goes back uh, six feet or so, whereas the chamber that you see, um, the chair with the, the, the plant on it, that's a chamber for the living that goes back, you know, um, uh, significantly. So this is a plan that, that, that indicates that. Um, you can imagine each of these chambers is just kind of separate uh, initially autonomous chambers that get pinned up against the hall. And, you know, one of the things that I think is interesting um, to me about this way of, of working is that, uh, you know, for this project is that like um, the relationship between chamber and this mask um, is, is varied, right? So, you know, if you're uh, deep in the living area, you might have a more telescopic relationship to the opening or if you're in the dining area, you might have a much more, um, you know, flat and compressed uh, and immediate relationship uh, to, the, to the environment beyond. One of the things that this yields um, is like uh, a, a, an unusual thinness in parts of the building. So, you know, in the hall, um, you have like fenestration on both sides, you're able to actually see through, through the hall, um, but then, you know, immediately adjacent to that, there's more depth. And so you're, you're looking into a, a bedroom and then there's a kind of veil in between that and the hall. So you, you, there's a kind of dialogue between these two openings that express the different different depth of the building. Uh, there's also an artist studio on on the on the, on the property. And um, we're drawing out walls as a way to define like a, a, a the space in between a kind of like micro urbanism, uh, if you will, a kind of campus um, that makes a, a center space. That is, you know, not toward the view, and also not toward the woods, but a kind of like a contained space. Um, and this is, you know, a, a, an early depiction of a view from the living area toward the, the studio space. So, as I mentioned, like we're certainly thinking about these as uh, autonomous chambers to the extent that we're like actually unwrapping them um, and imagining them as like, you know, uh, like an unfolded elevation that 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 depicts each of them. And I guess I just want to draw out the distinction between the, the kitchen, um, which has a certain depth, and the dining, which has a totally different depth relative to um, its threshold. And then another example, the bedroom, which um, uh, is on, there are bedrooms on either end, which produce a kind of privacy just by way of their uh, lack of proximity to the center, which is the more social area. So I'll just flip through these as a kind of animation, but you can see how um, uh, each of the, the main spaces, like in this case, the dining space, it's really compressed. And then we use each of the programs as a way to help us understand what's possible in terms of the, um, uh, the, the, the window proportion and size. So in this case, there's an extremely low window so that you know, it, it, it encourages um, you know, a relationship between it and the bench where one's sitting and having a view out. Um, as opposed to, let's say, like the living area, which is like a much more telescopic. And then there is the occasional look backward, which is the, the kitchen um, looking out toward the, um, oh, this is the entry, I'm sorry. But, um, you know, I think you get the idea. Um, and as I mentioned before, there's a, 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 like a, a pretty direct relationship between the, uh, the, the fenestration and the program. And so, like, uh, this is something that we think a lot about, like, trying to, um, yeah, like help us make a composition that is um, like on the one hand, like proportionally, uh, like there's there's measure uh, and, and like an understanding of the overall composition, 
but uh, we're also trying our best to like make sure that we're not bringing in our own kind of uh, bias. Not because we we don't think like intuition is is good. I, it absolutely is. But I think like we we're always looking for an opportunity to learn and make something that we wouldn't have made uh, with with you know uh, uh, if it weren't for the the particularity of the client or the site or the context. So. Um, that's why we're kind of interested in this like drawing out of logic um, that you see in a slide like this. This is a view looking um, from the hall into the kitchen um, out to the back and then um, the, the living area looking out toward the view. Um, I realize we're getting really close to the to the end here. Um, I do want to show you one more project and if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, leapfrog this one. This one is called House of the Woodland. And then I'm just going to land on this last project here that uh, is uh, on our plates right now. Um, this is a, um, a project for uh, Western Massachusetts. It's a shed roof. And um, we're uh, imagining that it is, uh, it's a project for a collector. And um, what you'll see is that like um, the, we're, we're using the shed, well, let me, let me step back just for a second. One way to look at um, the projects uh, we think is through roof typology. So um, when we kind of look back at all of the, the houses that we've been working on, I think you can kind of one can kind of chart out um, an interest in exploring different roof typologies and the implications that roof typologies have on everything from, you know, the way that water drains to the way that uh, you might be able to produce drama because of, um, you know, what's possible in terms of fenestration or uh, what's possible in terms of the distribution of programs sectionally. And so um, for this project, we're really interested in the shed roof. And you can see we're borrowing from um, Ziegler Lawrence to think about how to extend that, um, that that roof in a way that doesn't impact the uh, inside structurally, but is uh, like a kind of exoskeleton. Um, and then that strange flag thing is us trying to um, imagine an alternative to like adhering to the code of letting smoke come out of the chimney, not through um, you know going up, but going out. Um, and so, as I mentioned, like this is a, a house for a collector, and so like. What does it mean to start to think about the program also as a collection of artifacts? And so um, here's our, our uh, kind of conceptual attempt to think about uh, the similarities across each of the programmatic um, elements and also their differences. Um, and so like what, what you're seeing is these sort of um, imagined plaster casts where um, you, of course, you see the kind of relentlessness of the shed roof, but also the hope is that you like see their um, like a, a finer grain of articulation and uh, motive, I guess is a good way to say it, uh, you know, in, in terms of their, um, uh, uh, the, the frames that uh, connect to fenestration. Um, so we're very much thinking about them as like this collection of artifacts and also thinking about what does it mean to populate a, a space um, for a collector and how could we begin to think through the rituals associated with it? Uh, so this is an initial pass um, at, you know, the kind of, unexpected, unusual wares that might, um, you know, give life to this space. And then, um, you know, this is an enfilade uh, project where um, it's, a, it's a biased enfilade in the sense that it is um, like pulled closely, as you see in this last image, and it pulled closely to um, the, the low side of the roof. And then um, there are like a series of um, small spaces that come off of the, the, the enfilade. And just to put two in juxtaposition with one another, uh, here is an, an imagined uh, you know, place for bathing. And then another one is um, an imagined um, uh, uh, access to a kind of hidden space above. And so, you know, we're always looking for opportunities to create these diptychs as a way to like imbue um, another layer of order in, into the project, both from a, a kind of conceptual standpoint, but from a kind of like representational as well as an experiential standpoint. Um, not to get too much into it, but um, there is an idea about like pairing of, of, of apertures. And this relates a little bit to um, the Hall House, um, using a different idea about like 
you know, if there's a compound figure, like if you look at, for example, the blue plus the yellow, like what are things that we can do to start to um, make that compound figure understood, not as though it represents one space or that there's one space behind it, but that there's, um, you know, different activities that are occurring in each of those spaces and that there's like a, a greater idea about like pulling them together um, uh, despite them being, you know, part of different spaces. And that happens again, you can see over to the right where you've got like a, a Clara story window with that square down into um, a bath bathroom and then um, a, a, another horizontally oriented window into the, um, the room above. There is a pavilion uh, as well, which is a kind of um, a counterpoint to the shed roof. It's a gable roof and it, it houses a, a hearth and a, a bath. Um, and I think um, this is where I'm, I'm going to end. This is the last slide. Uh, this is this is a view of the pavilion and uh, I land on this one because I think it's one that tries to uh, pull together a lot of layers of thinking um, from like hyper quantitative in terms of uh, the kind of like severe and abstract relationships between the roof edge um, and you know like uh, the sort of severity of the the roof relative to um, the, the the edges of the building uh, but also like the qualitative aspects, um, what the light might do, or um, how the weathers might produce a um, unexpected pattern of, of snow. So um, with that, I'd just like to thank you for listening and I, I'm happy to take uh, uh, questions or, or, or feedback. Thanks so much. Liam, thank you. This is, uh, I'm gonna jump back in again and have, uh, say thank you, but just, I. I you could have kept going as far as I was concerned. I mean, I was just kind of like floating along there. I, 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 I wanted to tell you how happy that made me feel. It's kind of interesting because it went off in the kind of realm and territory in the kind of way that, that not a lot of architects speak uh, just in terms of not having, I mean, I, I actually really appreciate how plain spoken you are about about what you're doing, when in fact what you're doing has a lot of complication to it and, 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 and bears uh, working out. So I wanna say there are a lot of attendees that both uh, in, the, in the Zoom room and also uh, on uh, YouTube. And maybe the thing to do is given we have so many people, I'm not gonna look at people's hands up. If you'll, in the chat room, let me know that you have a question and then I'll pass it along to Liam. Or if you'll mark that on YouTube, uh, uh, Leora will let me know and I'll, Again, I'll pass it on, but maybe I'll start uh, just really quickly. So I, I, I want to say, like, uh, 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 you know, it, it strikes me that there, there's uh, the, one of the kind of pleasures of, about hearing you talk is that uh, that you, uh, you it, it also has to do with your presence. I, I want to go back to this whole thing about you being like a middle schooler in a way, like 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 the, 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 the things that you keep. Uh, it's very charming, kind of very direct way, kind of like 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 a, a, a bringing me into the kind of idea that what you're doing is actually normal or, or there's a there's a kind of normative to it when in fact you drive all of your projects in various ways towards uncanniness right and i mean and i wondered a little bit if you would talk about that i mean there's a long history of uncanny american architecture right there's a long history especially in the protestant landscape of the upper northeast right there's just super crazy on the other hand it seems to me that you could also make a kind of justification for uncanniness as needing to be something that's true of architecture as a way that it supports life right now. So and I'm wondering where you are on that, where that's coming from in your, in, in your own work. And then I've got yeah. a question. Other people have questions that are coming in. That's, I love that question. Um, so like one of the things that I uh, think a bunch about is like whether it's possible to develop a form or a figure or a work of architecture that is like uh, resists immediate classification. Like, I don't know about you, but like when I look at work, like I am so tempted to try to categorize it. Like, um, and I'm, I'm not happy about that, but um, it's something I do. Like I try to understand it and like ascribe it to a lineage and that gives me some satisfaction that I that I know it that I can kind of like uh, understand it and like you know be there's like a some kind of satisfaction about understanding its motives and how it got to be and like one of the things I try to do or we try to do is like to develop things that 
can't do that as readily. Like, is there a way that you can kind of subvert expectations? And that can happen a number of ways. That can happen on like an initial reading, right? Like the figure kind of absorbs enough, uh, uh, let's say like uh, difference or reference that it like can't be singular in its reading or that can happen maybe uh, over time. Like maybe there's like a, a, a way that you think you know it and then on closer inspection or, um, you know, uh, in terms of like a, another scale at which you, at which one relates to the thing that undoes what you thought you knew before. So like this idea of, of trying to, um, yeah, resist immediate classification, something that's on my mind um, always. Another way to think about it is um, like a term that we tend to use a lot is like a quest for defamiliarization. Like the thing you thought you knew is actually not that thing. And so like to try to, and this actually relates to your first comment that you made, David, about like the digital. Like if there are some who like make amazing work out of uh, otherness and alien form, like I think we try to try to make unexpected work out of like fairly um, like vernacular or um, um, familiar things that then have some deviation from that familiarity or from that vernacular. And so like, um, it's a kind of different way of thinking about the, the uncanny, right? Like it's, it's like all, it's like, I guess it's about access too. Like, I think we're hoping that like, if you, if one, like there are so many different audiences, right? We're hoping that like a lot of audiences can be compelled by the work because it is like, uh, at some level accessible and at some level it is strange and it's um, idiosyncratic and it's unique. And it's that balance between like, um, accessibility and defamiliarization, I guess, that uh, we try to like, like work on the uncanny. Uh, yeah, we could open this up a little bit more, but I have a question, a couple of questions from students. Uh, the first is uh, Jacob DeSuda. Jacob, do you wanna uh, jump in and uh, ask a question here? Uh, that'd be great, I appreciate it. Um, I wanted to first thank you for taking the time to present your lecture today. I found it incredibly insightful um, and inspiring. Um, it appears that uh, to bridge the limitations that the digital consumption of architecture presents, such as the lack of idiosyncratic or temporal perceptions of the project, uh, you rely in the initial representation of your projects on the, on the idea of the narrative or the ritual to, pro to project a type of mundanity and thus relatability into your visualizations to bring the two-dimensional and static idea of occupancy usage and therefore time. So my question is, uh, does the attempt to bridge these two dimensions affect the way in which you approach your projects, such as the idea of the room being defined by its rituals and the objects it contains to define those rituals more than something which is spatial and which cannot translate as successfully into its digital interpretation? Cool, yeah, thanks, Jacob. That's a really cool question i like that a lot like um i think the relationship between like the stuff inside the the wares and the props and the rug that has the the wrinkle in it and like the leaf that's placed there like i i think that that is um one layer that is in dialogue with the thing that we made which is like the work of architecture right like um i i kind of think like it, I think about it as like thickening the plot um, and like uh, ensuring that there that we're our hunch is headed in the right direction. Like, um, I, I guess to say that differently is like when we put those objects in the space and we're imagining those rituals playing out. Like, we're I'm certainly not thinking about that in a kind of deterministic way. Like, I I think in in all likelihood the way that that space will be lived in will be different than that. But it's a way of um, kind of yeah, like keeping in check the role of, of, of the work of architecture. Like, I feel like the more that, and, and we objectify works of, of architecture, right? We, we look at them in that way as well. I think any architect has to, they have to understand it as an object, understand it as uh, an environment. Um, and I think like maybe a good example is like, we're super excited to see things at like a kind of model scale. 
but meanwhile, we're also super excited to see things like completely occupied, not just uh, as like a perspective looking at a, a vacant space, which can be helpful as well, but more as like, um, yeah, like about the lives lived within. I, I, I feel like those two things there, yes, there's a kind of like um, zone that links them, but I kind of think that think about them as two different layers. Like one interesting third layer actually is the layer that is like the interface between those things and the object of the work of architecture. Like, you know, like when we're prompted to think about what the grain of the wood is and why on an interior, like that's neither uh, aware nor is it um, like a, 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 a thought about geometry, right? It's like this like amazing middle ground that is both about the 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 wear right and how the reflection of that wear hits against the wood and its matteness or its shininess but it's also about the geometry right like those planks of wood uh, abide by like geometric principles um, so I'm not sure if I'm answering your question um, but like just some thoughts about yeah the relationship between ritual and architecture um, as like objects that we need to make thank you yeah that was very insightful. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, another student question from Donald Turner. Donald, Don, are you out there? I'm here. All right, sweet. Um, uh, where's the mixed use complex in the Bahamas? And what's the name of the project? Uh, where is it? Um... Uh, it's yeah, it's some it's on an island in the Bahamas, and it doesn't have a name yet. We're actually uh, it's a, actually a really timely question because um, the the client who is awesome um, is uh, like has prompted us to think about the name. I think uh, we 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 do spend a lot of time thinking about names, and so um, it's it's actually like a pretty important thing for 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 the project that we haven't gotten to yet <laughs> so uh right now it doesn't have a name it's we refer to it as uh like the house in the bahamas we refer to it sometimes as like a jungle house oftentimes we refer to it as like the grotto with a plate with a still life on top <laughs> i don't think that's going to be the title but um that's that's where it is right now and uh, how tall will the observation tower be um that's a good question i think so um i'll answer that by describing it from an experiential standpoint like our hope is that the lower level it, given that it's going to be defined by vegetation is like a grotto it's low it is about like horizontality it's like hopefully like um uh quite dark um and, and out of the sun and then you know if that's let's say eight feet plus a two foot plate let's say it's ten feet and then you have the, the boxes above, which are going to have, um, they're going to be uh, attenuated and uh, we think, and be kind of um, extreme in their vertical proportions. Uh, so let's say that's 16 feet or something, and maybe one of them can be occupied above. So, you know, we're, we're thinking 16 plus, you know, 26, it's 30 feet in the air or something like that. But I like the question because it prompts me to think about like the different layers that one would move through to go from the grotto to the still life to this observation tower that will give you give one of you toward toward the ocean. Um, Thanks for the question. So we, we've got some faculty who are who, who are out there wanting to ask questions, but we one more student a quick question. Maybe you can answer it kind of quickly. A student asked early on from from the YouTube feed. If you could talk a little bit about the craftspeople you work with, how do you find the craftspeople? What role do they play in the exploration of the materials you're using? Or, how, I mean, the question is really, where is that coming from? I, you, you answered the question about visualization and use it with contractors, which I just thought was super interesting. This kind of different way of making a kind of working drawing where you, where the working drawing is <laughs> actually an, an image, right? But could you talk a little bit about the degree to which craftspeople drive what you guys, or you guys drive what craftspeople do? Essentially the, yeah. the, the question, yeah. Yeah, no, I think one of the um, the groups that uh, we've uh, worked with a whole bunch is um, uh, Cora, who, who are out in Wisconsin, um, and one of my uh, former students is, uh, uh, is, is there. Uh, actually, a couple of the former students are, are there, and uh, they are um, the ones who have been helping us a lot with the big stone pieces. Uh, and actually, they were uh, heavily involved, uh, really heavily involved, 
um, in the other other masks as well. And so um, that we've we've learned a ton from them in terms of um, in terms of like 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 I mean you know they are like just so like, brilliant as craftspeople and like have an understanding of 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 rock and marble that you know we you know think about like, like we we tap into um, uh, like in a real way. Um, I think it's you know just like anything it's like a back and forth like um, I'm not saying anything that original here but like there we have ideas about um, how we think that the the thing will be working in space like for instance for instance like the kind of tapering of that um, that that fireplace and you know thinking about the limitations of that or um, the challenges of stitching together three pieces of stone or you know trying to I mean one really fascinating thing I found um, in this process was like trying to to kind of um, uh, imagine or um, predict what the grain would be once you start to mill away, and you know I don't if it wasn't for them I don't think we would have like achieved that kind of like rotational and spiral that you see on 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 the face of that um, stone piece in the living area of, of House of Horns. So it's just like you know uh, like stonemason's knowledge, like years and years of knowledge that like uh, we absolutely tap into and are, are grateful for. Uh, but I like to think that we challenge our fabricators uh, too, you know, and um, like, I think they've been prompted to do things that they wouldn't ordinarily do. And I think they've been grateful for those kinds of challenges. So um, yeah, certainly a 50-50 a, a collaboration for sure. I'd say 60-40. I, I think you guys drive it a lot harder than most. I mean, like, I think you guys drive at 70 30 you guys drive it a lot harder than you're than you're letting on here liam I and mean, you guys you're being very very modest here michelle uh, you have a question as well I'm gonna pass yeah it first of all liam i think uh it looks liam like my, my uh i think he may have frozen on us here liam can you hear us liam you may have to drop out and drop back in Uh, let me just send him a quick text. It was going to be a difficult question. So <laughs> he knew he knew when to bail. <laughs> <laughs> guy is guy is really smart. You know, for a, I think he just dropped out and is going to drop back in here in just a second. And then uh, Mike, I'll let you have the final word here if we get if we get Liam back. Uh, Leora, do you see him on the? Uh, no, not yet. I'm keeping my eyes peeled. I mean, there were enough emergency vehicles going by him <laughs> there that his, his building might actually just be on fire. <laughs> you know, it's entirely possible that he's... <laughs> and several different kinds of emergency vehicles. I, I, I heard the panoply of different types of sirens uh, throughout this. Yeah, it was every every Boston, everything that you could possibly go wrong in Boston and Cambridge is like going by the window. You know, it's fascinating, like a like a collection of different emergency sounds from that from that zone, bringing back kind of frightening memories. Let me see. Uh, someone just joined us. No. Or dropped. Or dropped. Hold on one second.
I just tried to call him, but his phone is busy. Uh, uh, given that, uh, I will I will mention that our our, our last speaker on next Monday uh, is uh, uh, Michael Bricker, who is one of our alumnuses, who have kind of went through architecture into uh, film set design and film work. And it actually, should be quite interesting. John Blood's hosting him. It should be. I mean, he's kind of taken off in this really intriguing career where producing one show after another uh, that are actually quite remarkable, quite remarkable kind of form of work. So I, I, I hope that you will uh, join us for that. And I look forward to it. Uh, there's Liam calling in. Hold on. Hey, Liam. No, I tell you what we're going to do. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to, it's a tough call because Michelle said she had a really difficult question for you. And so you're going to have to, <laughs> I think we're going to have to call it a day. And what we're going to have to do, what we're going to have to do instead is have you down here next year sometime for reviews. And then we'll get Mike McCall wanted to say hello. And he had a question for you and a comment. He, he's not going to get to make it. Michelle's pissed off at you now. We're all <laughs> pissed off at you once again. Kevin Alter's pissed off at you. Uh, I just, I just want to say that once again, you've let us down, but go ahead, man. Go ahead and go ahead and enjoy your life up there on the Upper East Coast, you know? Yeah, just go ahead, yeah. Put him on speaker. No, no, no. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. It, it, FaceTime with me? No, that's it. That, okay, no, no. No, 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 don't do it that way. Here's the deal. We're just going to say goodbye, and everyone's going to, uh, 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 everyone's going to turn their mics on and applaud for you right now. Uh, everyone out there, would you please turn your mics on and we'll, 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 okay, Liam. Oh my gosh. It rarely happens. All right. Yeah, all right. Sorry, folks. This, this, this rarely happens. Uh, I'm happy to take questions this way, but David won't let me. Oh, uh, well, I will let you. Uh, Michael, uh, uh, actually, Michelle, you're going to have to save your questions. I think it's going to be long to you. Yeah. Mike, do you want to make a, 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 a last quick call to say goodbye? Yeah, yeah, Liam, this is Mike McCall. I really just wanted to say hello. Michael, you got to turn your, your sound up. It's all the way up. Oh, hold on one second. I've got... All right, Mike, do it again now. Hey, Liam, I just wanted to say hello. <laughs> uh, tell you how much I liked uh, this presentation. Can you hear me now? I can't hear Mike. It's, 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 the, it, dude, it's, it's the usual. All right, guys. Well, we'll say goodbye to everybody. Thank you so much. Hey, Liam, let's hang for two seconds. Guys, thanks a lot. I'm going to end it here. See you next